Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I think Dr. Pratham is ready to start now. So I'm just here to give a brief introduction to him. I'm sure he's no stranger to any of you, but uh, we always let you know who uh, a little bit about your resource person. Uh, so Dr. Pratham entered the Faculty of Medicine in 1998 and graduated in 2003 with second class honors and distinctions in uh, pathology and biochemistry. He then went on to have a, a very distinguished career in his postgraduate training, uh, winning the gold medal for postgraduate diploma in child health in 2008. He joined the Department in Pedi of Pediatrics in 2011 uh, and has since then developed several special interests which include uh, growth and development and research into Down syndrome. I hear he's a very popular teacher. Uh, and uh, very aware of student needs. So I'm sure you will have a wonderful session today. So uh, thanks very much for agreeing to do this session for PEMSA. Uh, Dr. Patum, it's a privilege to have you with us. Uh, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Champa, for the introduction. Uh, I think we have more than 100 participants, so we'll start our uh, lecture today. I'm also happy to see that some wet students have also joined. I could hear a lot of barking going on. Uh, so today we are what we are going to do is uh, uh, we will learn about failure to thrive of an infant uh, which is a very hot topic among uh, long cases as well as uh, in uh, structured essays so i'm going to present you an actual case right it's an actual case which we uh, saw in our clinics so we'll go from birth to eight months of a child who came with failure to thrive and try to cover each and every area uh, regarding failure to thrive using this child. So what I'm going to do is I'm from uh, time to time I will give some information and you need to build up uh, the presentation using your skills in history taking and examination. Okay. So to give a brief introduction this is uh, the, this child was first seen at the age of seven months sorry two months okay, he was first seen at the age of two months and this is his growth chart mother is a 26 year old young lady uh, she has taken pre-pregnancy folic acid the baby's birth weight was 2.2 kilos and anomaly scan done at 21 weeks showed a normal fetus it was uncomplicated vaginal delivery at and the baby was delivered at 39 weeks. So 26 primary uh, with a with pre-pregnancy folic acid taken, delivered a normal uh, baby at 2.2 kilos at 39 weeks with an anomaly scan, which was concluded as normal at 21 weeks. So when we go to antenatal history, regard to this birth chart, what are the things you might ask in history taking from this mother? Can anyone tell me one by one, what are the important aspects in history taking regarding the antenatal history? Any volunteers? Oh, I can uh, were you, uh, spell out some. Uh, were, you, uh, uh, were you diagnosed with any uh, any uh, GDM or uh, 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 hypertension and during uh, antenatal? Right. Okay. It, actually, the question should be not GDM, whether chronic diabetes. It was gestational diabetes mellitus, GDM. What should happen to the birth weight? It should be a high birth yes, weight. Yes. Okay. Here. Yeah. We have a low birth weight, so whether the mother had chronic diabetes mellitus, because if a mother has this for a long time, it can cause vasculopathy, which can happen. So a mother with diabetes mellitus, persistent diabetes mellitus with vasculopathy can have a very poor placenta, which can result in a uh, small, uh, sorry, uh, small for gestational age baby. Whether the mother has got any infection during the pregnancy? 
during the pregnancy very good in which trimester you in interested in first trimester second or third uh, third trimester third trimester okay most of the time it's usually the first trimester infection which we should be worried about okay third trimester you can get infection but very rarely it will affect the fetal growth right so normally it is the infections which are occurring in the first trimester which can affect the fetal growth okay so yes at any trimester you can get infection but mainly the first trimester any other things behavior social behavior anything else active or passive smoking i know it's smoking okay so whether there is a history of smoking or whether there is a history of ingesting at the same time you have to ask whether she was on drugs that means medicines medications so we'll go through the antenatal history and see whether we have taken the correct history so yes whether pregnancy induced hypertension was present treatment taken or not whether the mother had pre-existing diabetes mellitus or any other vasculopathy for example a mother with systemic lupus uh, erythematosus sle can deliver a baby with a low birth weight due to a vasculopathy whether the mother had previous miscarriages now this surprise me but we don't know whether the mother had previous miscarriages and alcohol use illnesses especially during the first trimester and most importantly maternal nutrition before and during pregnancy okay maternal nutrition before and during pregnancy a malnourished teenager if she becomes a malnourished mother later on can have a low birth weight baby okay and also sometimes mothers might have poor dietary habits during pregnancy especially during the first trimester because of excessive vomiting they are also in danger of delivering a baby with low birth weight so these are the important things in antenatal history which you should ask then postnatal history okay during the second now this child was seen at two months and when you go to the chart you can see that during the first two months or postnatal period the child has been growing along the minus 3st centile there is no sign of catching up there is no sign of catching up so what are the things you should ask which is relevant for this period for the postnatal period adequate breastfeeding for the child okay adequacy of breastfeeding whether the child has been breastfed enough or adequately okay good any other thing uh, neonatal infections yes neonatal infections or neonatal jaundice neonatal meningitis so those that, that type of infections can cause failure to thrive even after birth okay what else especially uh, regarding examination of the baby or appearance of the baby do we need to ask something from the mother a cleft lip baby will not grow along the centile if there was a cleft lip there will be a drop now here in this chart there is no catch up but at the same time there is no drop he is growing along the minus 3 st centile so cleft lip is a little bit unlikely you have to ask whether it was a syndromic baby sometimes syndromic babies might not be able to catch up but they will be growing along a centile but may not be able to catch up so we need to go through the postnatal as one of you said feeding especially the technique and adequacy whether the proper technique of feeding is used and whether the breast milk the child is getting is adequate or not and how do we check whether the breast milk is adequate you need to ask about the urine output normally roughly a child should be passing uh, about 6 to 8 times urine and bowel motions normally one to two per day but there can be a lot of variation like right? uh, for example a healthy neonate might sometimes pass five to six times a day or pass stools once in five to six days so breast uh, breast feeding and stool output actually does not have a good uh, relationship right sometimes well fed babies might have a very low bowel motion 
and sometimes underfed babies might have a high bowel motion, right? But urine output and breastfeeding has a good correlation. And also you have to ask whether a baby is sleeping at least two to three hours after a feed. If a child is uh, sleeping two to three hours after a feed, that is also indication that the baby is getting adequate milk supply. Uh, we need to ask whether additional milk feeds were given and we need to ask from the mother whether she has noted any abnormal smells. Why do we ask that? Why abnormal smells? Uh, to exclude inborn errors of metabolism. Excellent. Okay. Because inborn errors of metabolism can present with low birth weight and poor postnatal growth. And some inborn errors, not all, some, especially organic acidemias, can have abnormal smells, abnormal hair color, abnormal skin color. So you need to ask those questions. Right? Then we need to know whether, now we are checking whether the baby is getting adequate milk, but at the same time you need to ask question to see whether the baby is losing energy by some other means. For example, polyuria or excessive volume of stools, like 10 or 12 times a day, or excessive vomiting. The co most common cause of excessive vomiting is severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the child might not be getting milk adequately, or she might be getting adequate amount of milk, but losing energy through urine, stools, and vomiting. So you need to cover each of this and ask for syndromic features, especially Russell Silva syndrome. Because Russell Silva syndrome or Silver Russell syndrome is not detected by an anomaly scan. Now, Down syndrome you might pick up in anomaly scan, uh, and many other syndromes you might be picking up. But Russell Silva syndrome is a clinical diagnosis, very difficult to pick up by anomaly scan. It, it will be almost never picked up by an anomaly scan. Okay. Right. So we'll go to the actual story. Uh, before that, so what are the DD now we have uh, regarding this baby. Now this is a list, a long list of differentials. Uh, when you look at this growth chart, can this be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or cerebral palsy? Is it likely? Is it likely or unlikely? What is the answer? Correct or wrong? Likely. Unlikely. No, if it is unlikely, unlikely. If it is uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, the growth chart will not grow. Right? Same way, if it's hypotonia or congenital infection, sorry, hypotonic condition, again you might see a drop in the growth chart and then later on pick up with therapy, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. So, HIE and myopathy unlikely. Congenital infection is likely because babies with congenital infection can have a low birth weight and they will grow but without showing a proper catch up. So congenital infection is likely. Severe cleft palate unlikely because again you should see a failure to thrive or a growth chart or growth rate not going along the central but dropping. So severe cleft palate unlikely. Maternal drugs, yes, there is a likelihood. Maternal drugs causing low birth weight and preventing a catch up. Primary lactation failure, sorry, before this. Primary lactation failure, again, unlikely because this child is growing along the centile. If it was primary lactation failure, again, you should see a drop in centiles. So primary lactation failure is unlikely. Maternal malnutrition, Syndromes and some metabolic disorders, as we mentioned, are likely. Can this be congenital heart disease? Can it be a congenital heart disease? Not a simple one. I am asking about a severe congenital heart disease. Again, you should see a drop in the growth line. Okay, congenital heart disease, there should be a drop in growth line. Then after surgery or after starting anti-failure drugs, you will see a catch-up growth. So this one is growing nicely along the minus 3ST. So congenital heart disease is unlikely. 
same way poverty is unlikely because even if a mother is poor her breast milk normally has enough calories to maintain at least a growth along the third centile so after excluding these at the moment what this child might be having is congenital maternal drug maternal malnutrition syndrome especially uh, russell silver syndrome some metabolic disorder or oh, this could be familiar okay. this could be a familiar growth pattern so we will see what the actual story is the mother is a 26 year old primary para in good health there have been no antenatal drug history in this mother mother's pre-pregnancy weight was very low 46 kilos and her birth weight was also 2.2 kilos father is somewhat better but still measuring at 56 kilos and the child is non-syndromic breastfeeding technique is good and adequate and as the baby was growing along the minus 3 st no intervention was done because with this history the most likely cause was a familial growth delay where mother was also 2.2 kilos and the baby was also 2.2 there were no syndromes mother was in good health no infections no drugs and the child did not have any abnormality so metabolic disorders were also excluded so at the age of two months we thought okay the baby is having a familial growth delay no intervention was done so now we are seeing the baby at uh, five we are going to go to five months but before we go further any investigation you might do at this point which is not not a must not urgent but any investigation you might do at this point with this history it looks like a familial growth delay but regarding this 2.2 birth weight any investigation you might do at this point any guesses yes to check for uh, evidence of infection so we can do some investigation like what you are correct uh, ESR and CRP we can do at C okay but for congenital infection what is the other thing you might do uh, torch screen but, very good okay so torch screen especially if the baby is symmetrically IUGR at birth if this baby was having asymmetrical IUGR, that means the, the uh, uh, problem has occurred during the third set. Hello? Yeah? Okay. So, if the baby was having asymmetrical IUGR, that means the, the damage has occurred during the third trimester. Right? If a baby has a normal head size and only the body is small, we call it asymmetrical IUGR. Right? Normal head size only the body is affected, we call it asymmetrical IUGR. That usually happens during the third trimester. So then no, no need to do a torch screen. But if this baby had symmetrical IUGR, that means head is small and the body is also small. Head, body, that means head, weight and length, all are small, then it is very likely that the insult occurred during the first trimester. Then it is better to do a torch screen and as you said, we can do a blood picture coupled with a full blood count and CRP. This is a term IUGR baby. So any intervention you might do at this stage. We can ask the mother to continue breastfeeding. Any Anything else we might do. Term IUGR. Will you start him on anything? Or if I help you, any supplements you might need to start? Will you start anything? We need to give multivitamins, right? You can add multivitamins if he is not already on. If clinically pale, you can add iron supplements, but normally term IUGR babies or term babies who have not grown well, 
are usually polycythemic at birth. Therefore, they have enough iron stores. So we don't usually routinely give iron to term IUGR babies. But if you think the baby is clinically pale or if your blood picture shows uh, iron deficiency anemia, you can add iron supplements. You can try expressed breast milk top-ups. If you think the child can tolerate further, right? Sometimes a baby might uh, breastfeed, but he might stop prematurely. Uh, because the baby is small and he is tired. So in that situation, you can express breast milk and give us top ups just to see whether you can increase the weight a little bit. Right. <coughs> so these are the investigation you might do and interventions which can help the child to grow. So he was put on and multivitamins. He was not clinically pale. So iron supplements were not given. And we now see the baby at five months. Okay. So this is the baby at five months. And he was at this stage, he was on exclusive breast milk. And mother is now complaining that the baby is not satisfied with breast milk for the last one month. And you can now see there is a progressive uh, failure to thrive. Okay. He is now, he was initially going along the third centile, but now he is moving further away from the third centile in a downward trend. <coughs> Sorry. So what are the things you are going to ask now in the history? Yeah, what are the important points you need to ask in this patient now? Once again, he had to assess the feeding, uh, the adequacy. Okay, and initially the feeding would have been okay, but now, yes, there can be some problems, especially if the mother developed breast problems like cracked nipples, engorged breast, uh, breast abscesses. Yes, the feeding might become uh, interrupted. Okay, any other things? Any other condition which might develop after second month? Gastro which is common? Reflux. Very good. So, gastroesophageal reflux is common after the second month. So that may be one reason why the baby is not satisfied with breast milk because he is regurgitating all the milk which he is drinking. Anything else? What is the coconut thyle? Infections. Okay. Any question you can answer infection in neonates and infancy? About 99% you will get it as correct. So whether the child developed any infections during this month. Okay. So we will go to the history part and see what we should ask. So feeding again, you need to ask whether the feeding is good. So urine output and bowel habits, sleeping time and duration, and whether he got severe reflux symptoms. Then it is always better to check the development milestones, whether there has been some delay or whether the child is developing normally. Again, you can ask for abnormal smells, abnormal hair color, rashes and abnormal breathing. Why we ask for abnormal breathing? A lot of children with metabolic problems, inborn errors of metabolism. The common inborn error of metabolism is organic acidemias. And when the acids are building up, they develop acidotic breathing. Okay. So children might come with unexplained tachypnea and failure to thrive. And if they have a abnormal smell or rashes, then there's a high chance you are dealing with a child with an organic acidemia. Uh, it's always better to see whether there are features of heart failure and liver disease because some conditions, some liver and cardiac conditions, the child can tolerate during the first few months, but later on he might decompensate. Okay, so heart failure might set in after about second or third month. So still it's okay to look for features of heart failure and liver disease. So at five months, now we have a different set of uh, uh, diagnosis or differential diagnosis, inadequacy of breast milk, significant reflux disease, myopathy, chronic systemic illness, poverty and neglect, inborn error of metabolism. Now out of these, Everything is correct except one. So what is that one differential which you can safely exclude?
there is one condition which is not matching. What is that? Yes? No guesses? Poverty and neglect. But poverty and no, poverty and neglect can be a reason because now initially the mother was able to give breast milk, but because of her poor nutrition during the latter part of breastfeeding, the breast milk is not nutritious. So the child might go down. It is myopathy. Myopathy is unlikely. Why? Because if it is myopathy, usually you see a significant weight loss during the first few months and then later on a slow catch up. Because children with myopathy, because of their hypotonia, has significant breastfeeding problems. So they will never have a proper growth during the first few months. Congenital myopathy, uh, children with prada syndrome, Down syndrome, they all have muscle problems and tone problems. And when you look at their growth charts, most of them, the initial two months, they have difficulty growing because the hypotonia is uh, interfering with breastfeeding. To establish a good and successful breastfeeding, you need a very nice tone. Okay, That's why children with myopathies and um, hypotonic conditions, they are always having poor growth during the first two months. So you will never see a pattern like this. In a myopathy, you might see a pattern like this, where you will lose weight and then slowly they will catch up because with age, with physiotherapy and occupational therapy, your tone improves. So with age, the child will start a slow catch up. Okay. So all these are at the moment uh, appropriate for a five month old child who is exhibiting a growth chart like this. So now we'll go to the actual baby. Uh, uh, on further inquiry, we have found that he feeds less than 15 minutes. Because if he feeds more than 15 minutes, he vomits. He sleeps around two hours after feed and bowel habits are once a day. He has developed colics and severe reflux at the age of three months and still persisting. Mother had tried formula feeds, but the child is refusing. Development is normal. He is mildly pale, but otherwise normal examination. There is no infection or hospitalization, no abnormal smells, no abnormal hair color and the breathing is normal. So what can we do now to improve this growth? What is your next step? What will you do? The child has severe reflux, tolerate formula. He has normal development, mildly pale, but otherwise Any suggestions? As he's uh, uh, already five months, uh, yeah. we can try to begin the complementary feeding. With, Excellent. Uh, food. Yes, very good. So normally we start complementary feeding at six months, but in a child who is not uh, thriving well, you can start early complementary feeding. There are about five indications for early complementary feeding. So those are Number one, failure to thrive. Number two, if a child is growing uh, too fast, then also you can start early complementary feeding. Okay, so failure to thrive, number one. Number two, a child is growing too fast on breast milk. There's overgrowth on breast milk. Number three, the mother has to go to work and she has practical difficulty expressing breast milk right so those are important words right just because before because mother is going to work you don't need to stop breastfeeding and go for complimentary the mother can express breast milk keep it expressing breast milk you can start early weaning the fourth one is uh, obvious a loss of a mother fifth one is um, medical condition in the mother which is preventing the baby from uh, continuing breastfeeding. For example, sometimes mothers might have conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or SLE, 
where the mother need to start cytotoxic drugs. So in that case, we might have to go only for about four or five months of exclusive breastfeed, then start complementary feedings, cut down the breastfeed and allow the mother to take her uh, cytotoxic drugs. Okay. And there's a sixth cause, sorry, I forgot. The sixth cause is severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. If a child is having severe reflux disease, you don't have to continue exclusive breastfeeding up to six months. You can start early complementary feeding at an early age of four months. Okay. Even at four months, you can try complementary feeding. But you might have to change the consistency of the feed. Normally we give a uh, puree or talap, but at four months you might have to give a fairly semi-solid food, which is easy to digest and slowly build up the consistency. Okay. So what interventions can be done? We can start early complementary feeds. We can add multivitamins and iron supplements if not already on. It is not compulsory, but you might do some basic blood or urine investigations. It is not compulsory, but if you are worried, you can do and you can continue anti-reflux medications, but only about 50% of children will respond to anti-reflux medications. And then reassess at six months because we need to see whether the child has a catch-up growth after one month of starting complementary feeds. Okay, this child unfortunately didn't come at six months uh, because of this COVID uh, uh, pandemic. So the mother brought the child after three months, that is at the age of eight months. And this is the growth chart. So he has basically not grown during the last two months and he has been growing not along the third centile but he is going further and further from the third centile. Now the growth chart is almost flat. The child is on complementary feeds and breastfeeds and uh, unusually he is still vomiting. Even at present he is still vomiting. Now what are you going to do? What are the options now? Can this be a reflux disease? Is it likely or unlikely? Is it likely, oh, unlikely or very unlikely? Unlikely. Because normally, we, what we see is after about six months, the reflux disease is uh, getting less and less simply because of two things. Say after about four to six months, the baby is most of the time uh, staying upright in an upright position. So gravity helps the child to prevent reflux, right? During the first two or three months, the child is always kept in a lying down position. So it is easy for the milk to reflux right to the throat. Okay? But after five to six months, the gravity will help to prevent reflux. And at the same time, by about five to six months, the gastroesophageal junction, the muscle tone in the gastroesophageal junction will become more stronger, preventing the reflux. Okay. And thirdly, once you start complementary feeds, you don't see reflux symptoms. So this vomiting still present is very unusual. So now we need to find a cause. We need to do some blood also at this point. Okay. So if you are going to do any blood test, what are the tests you might order at this point? What are the basic tests you might order? Serum electrolytes. Electrolytes, very good. Okay, serum electrolytes. What else? Full blood count. We have, we have. If not already done, we need to do so. Full blood count, serum electrolyte. Give me three more. Normally, we would have seen us doing that in wards or clinics. Serum creatinine. Yes, uh, so we do renal function test. Then same way we do liver functions. Okay, STPT and SGOT. So full blood count, electrolytes, renal function, liver functions. With the full blood count, you can go for a blood picture. And then finally, you might do a UFR and urine culture because sometimes subclinical 
UTI can be there, which is not, uh, which is preventing this child from having a normal growth and the vomiting may be due to the subclinical UTI. Feeding, anything we need to ask about feeding? The child may be normal and the mother might not be feeding properly. So what are the things which now it, it just says the child is on complementary feeds, but there may be something wrong with the feeding. So what are the things you are going to ask regarding feeding? The frequency of uh, breastfeeding. Yeah. So by now, the frequency of breastfeeding should be much less compared to the first six months. Okay. Anything else regarding breastfeeding and diet and the main meals? Should there be a gap between the main meal and breastfeeding or no gap? Or can you give breast milk as a dessert soon after a meal? No. Can't give. Uh, before a feed, there should be at least three hour gap between the breastfeeding and feeds. After a main meal, after a main complementary meal, if you give breast milk, there can be two things happening, right? Soon after a meal, if you give breast milk, two things can happen. One is important nutrients in the food might not get absorbed because uh, particles in milk can uh, make complexes, especially calcium in milk and iron in food can combine together. So in a child who is getting breast milk soon after a meal might end up having iron deficiency anemia. Second thing is milk is easy to drink but the main meal is difficult to eat. So if you are giving breast milk immediately after a meal the child might learn to eat less and wait for the breast milk. Okay. Therefore the child might not grow properly. So you have to always advise the mother to wait at least two hours after a main meal if she really want to breastfeed. Okay. Then the child will eat a healthy meal rather than waiting for an immediate breast milk. Right. The third thing is whether the child is excessively breastfeeding at night. Any child who is excessively breastfeeding at night is not getting adequate sleep and you need adequate sleep for growth. So these are the things you need to ask. Consistency of the feet. Whether the child is still on a liquid based meal because now by, by eight months, the child should be on a semi-solid, not even pure foods. But some others might still continue to give things like kanji, which is mainly liquid. And timing of feeds, which we have been mentioning. Excessive breastfeeding and breastfeeding immediately after feeds, you need to check. Then you need to check the quality and the quantity of the complementary feeds. So quality means whether enough protein is given, whether enough animal meats are given, uh, whether uh, legumes are and pulses are included, whether the child is getting enough uh, fat and carbohydrate. And then finally, the habits, whether the child is distracted during feeds, whether the mother is bribing or forcing, all these can lead to improper complements. So you need to ask these things in your history. Then systemic symptoms, which we might have to ask is whether the, there is vomiting. Yes, this child is having vomiting. Together with vomiting, whether he is having diarrhea, polyuria or liguria. Breathing abnormalities, pallo, hepatosplenomegaly, palatable kidneys and whether there are features of chronic liver disease and kidney disease. So at eight months with a growth chart like this, we have now a new set of uh, differentials. Inadequate complementary feeds, wrong feeding methods, celiac disease, familial growth delay, fructose intolerance, gastroesophageal reflux, chronic medical condition, poverty and neglect. Out of these, uh, there are two conditions which are unlikely. What are those two conditions? Um, familial growth delay and your... Uh, there is a question before this. Can, can be pyloric stenosis as well, but pyloric stenosis will not 
not go on until about eight months before by that time the child should be in circulatory shock okay any answers for this there are two things which are unlikely GORD. GORD, yes. Good. One more. Very simple. Can this be familial growth? Delay? Familial growth. Delay. Yeah. Familial growth delay can't be because then the familial growth delay, he should be growing like this along third center, not going away from the centers. So familial growth delay and gastroesophageal reflux disease are unlikely. Wait. Sorry, fructose intolerance can be a possibility. I have uh, erased this by mistake. Uh, this is too much for you, but just it's okay to remember. Fructose intolerance is a very rare condition, but normally children who are having fructose intolerance during the first six months, they are growing okay. And then by, by, by six months or by five months, when the child is being introduced fruits if he is having fructose intolerance the child will start to have failure to thrive okay fructose intolerance is usually due to intolerance of fruits or fructose in fruits so this child can be having fructose intolerance because up to about five to six months he was okay after starting weaning he is worsening further Right. So the conditions which are possible is inadequate complementary feeds, wrong feeding methods, chronic medical condition, poverty and neglect. Because with poverty and neglect can lead to inadequate complementary feeds or wrong feeding methods. So in this style, the quality of feeds were good, but the quantity was low. There was no poor feeding habits. Vomiting was still present, mainly during feeding. Significant pallor was present. Now, now initially it was mild pallor, but now significant pallor, mild tachypnea, but the lungs are clear. Okay. Can anyone come into a diagnosis, possible diagnosis using this history? I will give you the uh, investigation results, which we have ordered before, but clinically, can anyone come to a diagnosis? Any possibilities? Yeah, any possibilities? See, uh, vomiting, hello, tachypnea, but lungs clear. Ah, there are some chats. Chronic medical condition, renal disease. Rafsan, you are correct. Okay, this you have to think of renal disease, the tachy, because in renal disease you can get a metabolic acidosis. In a renal disease you might get tallow because of poor erythropoietin production. And in a renal disease you get uremia, therefore the child will start to get vomiting, continuous vomiting. Okay, so celiac disease a little bit unlikely. Celiac disease because apart from these, the child was normal in celiac disease your thinking is correct but in celiac disease i would have given information like buttock wasting uh, severe muscle wasting but this child did not have that uh, what else thalassemia major manifest this way yes then uh, i would have said there is presence of hepatosplenomegaly right i didn't mention that and uh, thalassemia major you can't get tachypnea. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Is it okay if mother completely omits breastfeeding after six to eight months and child is fully on complementary feeds? Is it a must to breastfeed up to two years? Well, normally we prefer the mother to breastfeed at least until one year because complementary feeding is not enough to meet the energy demand of the child. Okay, to meet the energy demand, you need both complementary and breastfeeding. 
but after one year after one year the normal adult diet is more than enough to meet the energy demand so after one year a mother has the choice either to stop breastfeed or still continue until two years it's not a must right ideally if a child is being continued to be breastfed up to two years it should not affect the day-to-day -day routines of the mother or child and breastfeeding should not affect the sleep right of the child at night and also it should not affect the main meals now a lot of times we see the child is breastfeeding to avoid the main meals then you should advise to cut down breast milk sometimes the child is breastfeeding at night without having a proper sleep that is also dangerous because growth hormone secretions may after one year growth hormone secretion mainly occurs during night during sleep so if you are continuously breastfeeding at night your growth hormone secretion will be blunted uh, Hirschsprung disease Hirschsprung disease uh, is unlikely because the child's bowel habits were normal and there is no abdominal uh, sorry abdominal distension in, mentioned anywhere during the history okay all the time we had a normal abdominal examination so Hirschsprung disease little bit unlikely so we'll now go to the results what next we thought of doing basic investigations full blood count blood picture liver function test renal function test and then venous blood gas okay it's always better to do a venous blood gas in a child with unexplained tachypnea right in a child with unexplained tachypnea always do a venous blood gas because that will show you whether there is a metabolic acidosis present or not and then a urine full report so in our child hp was 7.2 and serum creatinine was very high. The normal should be 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 milligram. This one was 2.3 milligram per deciliter. So about four times more than the normal. Venous blood gas revealed mild metabolic acidosis. UFR was normal. So what next? What next will you do? Yes, renal tubular acidosis. There are some more answers coming. So, could it be due to mild degree of diaphragmatic hernia? No. Uh, diaphragmatic hernia, mild degree diaphragmatic hernia, very rare. But diaphragmatic, uh, not diaphragmatic hernia, sometimes hiatal hernia can come like this. Okay. Hiatal hernia can be like this. So, it's not mild diaphragmatic hernia, hiatal hernia, but hiatal hernia presenting in this age group, very, very rare. So what next? You have said ultrasound of the abdomen. Yes, the correct answer should be not ultrasound of the abdomen, abdomen and KUB. Okay, ultrasound of the abdomen and KUB. So we did that and it showed bilateral dysplastic kidney. So this was a child with bilateral dysplastic kidney. He has been having that condition all the way from beginning. But for some reason, he did not manifest severe vomiting or features of chronic renal failure during the first few months. And unfortunately, the mother was very small made. Mother also had the same birth weight. So initially, we thought this is a case of a familial growth delay. And then at five months, we thought, okay, it must be might be due to severe reflux disease and inadequate breastfeeding. That's why we started complementary feeds. But by the time the child reached eight months and still not growing, you need to do all this investigation. And fortunately, we made the diagnosis of bilateral dysplastic kidneys. Okay. So we will now go to this graph. And these are the ways. There are about one, two, three, four, five, six ways of failure to thrive, which you might come across. Okay. So you might come across a child who's fa having failure to thrive from birth. Okay, from birth, he is going down and crossing centers. From birth, you can divide it into two parts with 
with low birth weight and with normal birth weight. So you might have a child with low birth weight who is not gaining weight properly or a child having a normal birth weight and now postnatally having failure to thrive. Or you might have failure to thrive during early few months like this child up to about first two months well and then failure to thrive or around six months like in our child right growing at along a centile until about five to six and then failure to thrive or you might have failure to thrive during late infancy or finally you will have failure to thrive after infancy right during early childhood so we'll go to a table and try to understand the different causes before that there's another chat why wasn't it picked up antenatally? Good question. Uh, this child's anomaly scan was done at 21 weeks, but further scans were actually not done because the mother did not come to the clinic, probably due to this COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Renal dysplastic kidneys are not usually picked up during uh, the antenatal scans done at 21 weeks. Right? There we look for anomaly scan and the anomaly scan might pick up, might not pick up. Okay, But normally it is done to pick major abnormalities. Dysplastic kidneys can go undiagnosed unless we do repeated scans. Okay, That's why it was not picked up antenatally. Say if a ultrasound scan was done at around say 36 weeks, then yes there is a possibility that you might pick up. But Remember, antenatal sc scans can't exclude uh, every anomaly. We have got enough patients with diaphragmatic hernia, right? full-blown diaphragmatic hernia, which have been missed in antenatal scans. And recently we had a twin delivery, which was missed in antenatal scan. So if they can miss a whole baby, then missing a kidney is not a big deal. Okay, there's another question. Can urine output be normal in this child? Yes. Sometimes some children, I asked that from Dr. Chanel also, in uh, some children with dysplastic kidneys, initially they are able to maintain a urine output because in this child, the, there was no complete dysplasia of the kidneys. There were some tissues functioning. Okay. Some of the kidney tissues were functioning in this child. That's why he was able to maintain a urine output. But with time, say after about probably after six months, he started having significant deterioration. This child actually is now being uh, dialyzed because his uh, renal functions further deteriorated. He went into oliguria. So he is currently being dialyzed. Right, we'll go to the next slide. So I said that there are six groups, right? from birth, with low birth weight, without, with, with normal birth weight, early few months, around six months, during late infancy, after infancy. So the same things I am going to show here, from birth with low birth weight, from birth, normal birth weight, early infancy, mid infancy, late infancy, after infancy. These are the common uh, etiologies for failure to thrive. So if you have a child who is having failure to thrive from birth with low birth weight, with low birth weight, these are the possibilities. One, it can be congenital infection. Number two, it can be a syndrome like Silver Russell syndrome. Number three, it can be an inborn error of metabolism. Okay, so some inborn errors, you can have low birth weight. Out of these three, I have highlighted this arrow because congenital infection is the most common reason. Then we go to the next group from birth with normal birth weight. Okay, from birth but with normal birth weight. So one, it can be still a syndrome like Down syndrome or Turner syndrome. They usually have normal birth weight but after that they start to have failure to thrive. It can still be an inborn error of metabolism. Some inborn errors of metabolism, the mother's placenta is able to handle the metabolites. So they grow very well during antenatal period. In the postnatal period, they start to have failure to thrive. 
But the most common problem where you see a normal birth weight child having failure to thrive is due to some kind of an anatomical defect like a cleft palate. Okay, so cleft palates or esophageal, uh, not a atresia, yeah, but esophageal stenosis or pyloric stenosis, jejunal atresia, yeah, those type of anatomical defects, you can have failure to thrive from birth, but with a normal birth weight. Then we go to early infancy where you see failure to thrive during the first two, three months of age. Sorry, there's another thing where from birth you get failure to thrive due to primary lactation failure okay primary lactation failure is inability inability or inadequacy of breastfeeding which is giving rise to failure to thrive then early infancy there are two causes two common causes primary lactation failure and severe reflux disease i have highlighted the uh, arrow of primary lactation failure because sometimes most of the time during the first one or two months, the mother is able to continue breastfeeding. But then later on, they start having problems with breastfeeding because sometimes you might have a poor feeding technique, but for the first month, there is some compensation because the baby's demands are low. So you are able to breastfeed. But during the second month and third month, when the demands go up because of the poor feeding technique or inadequacy of breast milk, the child will start to fail to thrive okay. and the other thing is early infancy you get severe reflux disease then we go to mid infancy that means around five to seven months of age why child children start to fail to thrive during a mid infancy uh, one reason is poor complementary feeding okay poor complementary feeding Number two, some inborn errors of metabolism can come after mid-infancy, especially fructose metabolism related problems. Okay, hereditary fructose intolerance is seen after six months because they don't get fructose containing foods before the age of six months. Then some syndromes during the first few months, the child might develop normally or grow normally and then after six months they might start to fail to thrive but they are not common so the most common thing uh, causing failure to thrive during mid infancy is poor complementary feeding then we we come to late infancy again poor complementary feeding is a problem chronic illnesses now become a major problem during late infancy and poverty and uh, conditions which are leading to failure to thrive after infancy after the age of one year again chronic illnesses are common poor feeding habits are again very common poor feeding habits means uh, excessive breastfeeding at night uh, excessive breastfeeding during daytime bribing forcing uh, then uh, distractions uh, improper quality or quantity of adult based diets all of these factors can cause failure to thrive after infancy and especially poverty neglect and abuse are also uh, leading causes of failure to thrive after infancy so if you can remember this slide then you can easily answer questions right so please remember this slide this is the main slide in this presentation which you need to remember because once you know the causes for failure to thrive at different ages you can decide what investigations to do and what management options you have okay so congenital infections you know what investigations like torch screen syndromes you might have to do karyotyping and genetic studies inborn errors of metabolism you need to do urine metabolites and blood tests anatomical defects you need to refer to sometimes the surgeon or the dental surgeon primary lactation failure you need to uh, re-establish lactation by directing them into lactation management centers like that when you know the course you know what to investigate and what to do now now we can go to our mcqs okay i have prepared 10 mcqs and 10 
single based answer questions but before we go there any questions you need to ask from this presentation We have finished our examination, sorry, presentation in exactly one hour. So anything you need to ask before I go to the MCQs. If you have any problems, you can put it on the chat box, right? <coughs> okay. So the first 10 questions will be MCQs. So I will put the MCQ and I'll give you about one minute to go through the MCQ and then ask questions. Right. First MCQ. So a baby with neonatal hepatitis defaulted clinic for four months and then presented with lethargy, poor feeding and focal seizures. What investigation, sorry, what investigations, right? It should be what investigations are needed for acute management of this child. There's a question whether worm infestations present in such a manner. Yes, worm infestations can present with severe pallor and failure to thrive, but usually after one year of age, not during the infancy period. Okay, after one year. Okay, what investigations are needed for acute management of this child? Any answers? Uh, we got an answer C, D and E. C, D and E. Then there's another A and T. Uh, there's A but not T. B, C, D. Okay. B, C, D. PTNR, Cerameloplide, blood glucose. Okay. So we'll go to the question. It's a child with neonatal hepatitis. So you need to understand that we are worried mainly about hepatitis defaulted clinic for four months. And now present with lethargy, poor feeding and focal seizures. Now, what are the drugs we give for neonatal hepatitis? Normally, there's no uh, proper drug because it's a condition which will heal by itself. But until neonatal hepatitis recovers or resolves spontaneously, you need to give fat soluble vitamins, especially vitamin A, D, E and K. Out of that vitamin K is very important because if you don't supplement vitamin K, you can have clotting abnormalities, coagulopathies. Okay. So this is a common presentation where you present with lethargy, poor feeding and focal seizures. And in a child with neonatal hepatitis, not coming for clinic, not on, uh, not on vitamin K, you have to suspect intraventricular bleeding which is a common presentation in children with any obstructive type of liver disease not on regular vitamin k okay so when you are presented with this a pt inr is must so the answer b is a must stpt stot will be anyway high because he was having neonatal hepatitis so even before defaulting clinic it would have been high even now it is high, but for acute management, STPT and STOT are not needed. So this answer is false. Serum eloclides and blood glucose, again, correct, because any child with lethargy, poor feeding and seizures, we had to do eloclides and blood glucose for acute management. So PTINR, serum eloclide, blood glucose b c d are correct crp this child we haven't mentioned anything about fever or any features of infection has not been said so being a crp is not uh, for acute management not important because this child has come the only thing because if in, in this uh, stem there is nothing mentioned about fever or or any any focus of infection so when you get a question like this, always concentrate on the 
information which is available in the stem right so all we need have is a hepatitis default in clinic now present with lethargy poor feeding and focal seizures so these three will be the answers i might convert this into a single best answer question right so in that case if this is a single best answer question what will be the correct answer out of these three ptinr serum electrolyte blood glucose what will you take as the correct answer blood glucose blood glucose okay b b someone has said ptinr b you can take blood glucose but now look at this uh, this is a baby who has now not come for four months so he's not a neonate it's an infant and we are talking about focal seizures if it was hypoglycemia or uh, electrolyte imbalance in a child who is more than one month age you usually expect a generalized seizure okay if it is a hypoglycemia or electrolyte imbalance you normally what we see is a generalized seizure but when you say a focal seizure lethargy and poor feeding that is highly likely of a intracranial hemorrhage so because of that the correct answer will be ptinr right uh, but for a multiple choice question all three can be taken right we'll go to the second question A newborn baby is crying excessively while being handled. Mother has noted reduced movement in left upper limb. An X-ray was done which revealed a clavicular fracture. The management of this child includes. Okay, you can put the answers in the chat box or you can directly say it. Yeah, what are the questions? Uh, okay, we have got ABD. ABD, uh, then C. ADE. Okay, right. We'll see. Uh, this is a multiple choice. So, paracetamol at regular intervals as a painkiller, even in a newborn, they are having pain. So, most of the time, we forget this part, right? So paracetamol at regular intervals as a painkiller is a must. For clavicular fractures, we don't immobilize upper limb using POP cast. Right? For a humerus fracture, which is the other common fracture. If a newborn is having a humerus fracture, you might use a POP cast. But still, even for that, what we do is immobilization of upper limb using a bandage. Okay. So POP cast is wrong, but you can immobilize the upper limb using a bandage. So A is correct, C is correct. Evaluate for possible herbs policy, very good. You need to check for possible herbs policy in a child with clavicular fracture because clavicular fracture means the child has a, had a difficult delivery, especially negotiating the cervix with the shoulders. So you can get a herbs policy. You don't have to check for vitamin D levels in the baby because clavicular fractures are very common. But if you see something like a femur fracture or a humerus fracture, which, which is a very large bone, which is unusual to be fractured, then it is okay to check the vitamin D levels, but not for a clavicular fracture. So someone has said A, C, E, no, row, A, C, and D. We don't need to check for vitamin D levels just for a clavicular fracture. Right? It is only done for a major bone fracture. Okay, next one. 
The pediatrician is called to urgently review a one-day-old baby who is profoundly cyanotic and do not improve with high flow oxygen. The chest x-ray performed shows increased pulmonary vasculature. What are the likely conditions? So this is obviously a cyanotic heart disease because with high flow oxygen, cyanosis did not improve means it's a cyanotic heart disease. So what are the possibilities? Okay, we have some answers. A, B, D. A, B, D. Uh, no. Uh, some answers are correct, but one is wrong. A, B, E. Again, two are correct, one is wrong. No, two are wrong. A, D, E. Wrong. <laughs> one is wrong. Right, okay, we'll go through the answers. Now, chest x-ray performed shows increased pulmonary vasculature means there is a high pulmonary blood flow. Okay, there is a high pulmonary blood flow. We call it pulmonary congestion. Okay, so there are the cyanotic heart diseases we divide into two groups. Okay, cyanotic heart diseases we divide into two groups. Cyanotic heart disease with high pulmonary vasculature or pulmonary congestion. The second group is cyanotic heart disease with low pulmonary vasculature or pulmonary oligemia. Heterogeophallo, there is a pulmonary stenosis. So when you have a pulmonary stenosis, you don't get increased pulmonary vasculature, you get decreased pulmonary vasculature. In pulmonary atresia, again, you have a decreased pulmonary flow but because of the PDA you can get a high blood flow into the pulmonary vasculature because now you have pulmonary atresia but there's a PDA now what happens is pulmonary artery is not functioning at, at the beginning but the aorta is supplying the lung through the PDA so this PDA is a left to right shunt which pump blood from aorta into the uh, pulmonary artery and because it's pulmonary atresia normally they have a large VST so the right heart blood will not go to the pulmonary artery because of the atresia the right heart blood will go to the left heart through the VST then go to the aorta and then from aorta through the PDA it will go to the lungs and get cleaned up okay so Large VST you can't get because large VST is not a cyanotic heart disease. So C is obviously wrong. TGA is correct because in transposition of great arteries, the left ventricle is supplying the pulmonary artery. Therefore, you get increased pulmonary vasculature. So the correct answers are truncus A, TGA D, and pulmonary atresia with a PDA. Fellow, it's cyanotic heart disease, but it doesn't have high pulmonary vasculature. BST has an increased pulmonary vasculature, but it is not a cyanotic heart disease. So, Petrology of Fellow and BST are wrong. Truncus, PGA, pulmonary atresia with a PDA are correct answers. Right, we we'll go to the fourth one. A seven-day-old male baby is brought with a one-day history of poor feeding and vomiting. He was born at term weighing 3,200 grams and his postnatal period was uneventful. His weight is 2,750 now after seven days. Blood glucose 1.2, sodium 1.24, potassium 6.8. The acute stage management of this baby includes 10% dextrose bolus, oral hydrocortisone therapy, normal saline bolus followed by normal saline drip, intravenous antibiotics, sodium bicarbonate infusion. 
what are the answers Okay, we have our answer. A, D, E, A, B, C, A, C, E. Mm. Some are correct. Some are wrong. We'll go through the answer. Now, what is the question we are dealing with? It's a child who has lost significant weight during the last seven, first seven days. He is having hypoglycemia, hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Therefore, this child is having congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a condition where you don't have enough cortisol or mineralocorticoids. Therefore, your perfusion will be low because mineralocorticoids are not there. So the child will come with hypolemia and because of low cortisol, you will end up with hypoglycemia and increase uh, tendency to get an infection. No, congenital hyperplasia can be triggered with infection or they might come with a picture which is suggestive of a sepsis. Okay. So, Obviously, answer A is correct. You need to give a 10% dextrose bolus because the blood glucose is low. So, A is correct. This is cortisol deficiency, acute stage. Hydrocortisone correct replacement is correct, but not oral. Okay, because in the acute stage, you need to give IV hydrocortisone replacement. So, hydrocortisone correct, but not oral. Therefore, answer B is false. So, A is correct. B is false. You have hypovolemia, especially when there is poor feeding and vomiting. So normal saline bolus followed by normal saline drip is correct. So A correct, C correct. Intravenous antibiotics, I told you congenital hyperplasia crisis can be triggered by an infection or sometimes severe infection might come with a congenital adrenal hyperplasia like picture. We don't know, right? During severe infections, your electrolyte imbalances can occur. You can have hypoglycemia, you can have weight loss, therefore no harm starting intravenous antibiotics. Sodium bicarbonate we can use but not as infusion. We don't give infusions in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. We go for oral salt replacement. So E is false. So the correct answer is A, C, D. A, C, D. Right. Should we give fludricortisone in acute stage? No, no need to give fludricortisone. In the acute stage, you give normal saline boluses and keep the uh, hydration. Once the acute stage is over, you give oral fludricortisone. Okay, so fludricortisone, you can start in the acute stage, no harm, but it will not work. The only way to bring up the circulation is by giving giving a bolus and a normal drip until IV high starts to function. Okay. Right. Okay. The fifth question. A 14 year old girl evaluated for delayed pubertal development suspecting Turner syndrome. Before that, there's another chat box answer. How about hyperkalemia? Yes, you can treat hyperkalemia. But there were no answers given. But if someone has said like uh, nebulizing with salbutamol to reduce the hyperkalemia, correct. Or if there is severe hyperkalemia, you can give uh, calcium gluconate. Okay. But for a neonate, potassium 6.8 is not very high. Remember in a neonate, uh, severe hyperkalemia is anything about about 7. So, 8 may be very high for us, but for a neonate, they can handle this. Okay. 
But if you want to bring the potassium down, you can give calcium gluconate. So if there was calcium gluconate infusion or calcium gluconate bolus as an answer, you can easily take it as The fifth question, the 14-year-old girl evaluated for delayed puberty development. What is the mission to support the above, above Turner syndrome? C and E. Two mm -hmm. which are correct. B, E. Yeah, got it. Correct. So, in Turner syndrome, remember, you have hypofunctioning gonads or, or what you call it as hypogonadism. Okay. So, in hypogonadism, FSH and LH will be very high, but estrogen will be very low. So in Turner syndrome, you have to do FSH, LH and estrogen level to show hypogonadism. But Turner syndrome is not the only condition which have hypogonadism. There are many conditions in children who might look clinically as Turner syndrome, but who is having hypogonadism due to other reasons. So just because you have low estrogen and high FSH and LH levels, it will not directly support the diagnosis of Turner syndrome. It will support the diagnosis of hypogonadism. But if you do an ultrasound of pelvis and you see streaky gonads, okay, which is a significant finding in Turner syndrome. So if you see a streaky gonads in the hand, then you can easily say yes, it supports the support the diagnosis of Turner syndrome and also the internal sexual organs like the uterus and upper vagina are not properly formed in Turner syndrome. Okay, there can be uterine abnormalities or uterine hypo uh, hypoplasia in Turner syndrome. So ultrasound pelvis is valuable and obviously karyotype is very valuable. Bone age normally in Turner syndrome is normal. Okay, so bone age is bone age will not support Turner syndrome. The answers are B and E. Six complaint of headache and dizziness during treatment. The blood sugar was found to have come down from. 22 to 2 millimoles within 2 hours. The next important steps in management is to sorry, the next important steps in management are to There's another question. Down syndrome is due to number or translocation. It can be due to both. Right? Non-disjunction down syndromes are common, 93%. Translocation downs are not very common. It consists about five, about four to five percent. So it can be due to increased number of chromosomes due to non-disjunction, also translocation. Answer so here. So this is a child with diabetic ketoacidosis being treated and now he is complaining of headache and dizziness. The blood sugar has come down very fast from 22 to 12 millimoles within two hours. Now that's a very fast drop. So you, what will you expect if there's a sudden drop in blood sugar, you can get cerebral edema. So the important steps in management should be to reduce the cerebral edema. There are answers. BCE, AD, CDE. Right, okay, we'll go one by one. There are some correct answers, not exactly correct, okay. 
Yeah, need to repeat is fast. Then you might come come up with uh, uh, worsening of cerebral edema. So you need to reduce the drip to re uh, prevent cerebral cerebral edema from worsening. Nurse the child in head low position. No, it's the other way. When you have cerebral edema, you need to nurse the child in head up position. So this is wrong. You can give IV mannitol to reduce cerebral edema. So A and C are correct at the moment. The sugar has come down very fast. So to prevent it going from further down, you need to add five percent dextrose to the drip. Okay. So it's it you can take either five percent or ten percent. So whatever you need to add some dextrose to prevent this from going down further. Because if it goes down further. The cerebral edema can become even more worse. You need to reduce the dramatic drop of sugar. Stopping insulin temporary is not recommended. You can't stop insulin. You can reduce insulin, right? Because if you stop insulin, ketone body production will occur, and then you will end up with again ketoacidosis. So the answer should be reduce the IV drip. The nurse, the child should be uh, child in head up position. So this is wrong. You can give IV mannitol. You can add five percent dextrose. The answer should be not stop the insulin, but uh, decrease the insulin infusion temporarily. Okay. So if the child is on point uh, one unit per kg, you can cut it down to point zero five unit, but not stop. Okay. All right. All right. A C D. Yeah. That is correct. A, C, and D. Good. Number seven. An eight-month-old developed an itchy rash, which seems most distressing at night. The rash is affecting mainly the flexural surfaces and back of the trunk. Skin is uniformly dry. The treatment of this infant includes. So eight month infant, itchy rash, most distressing at night. There are two rashes which can come at, at this age. One is eczema, or the other thing is scabies. Okay, eczema or scabies. Both rashes are distressing at night. But here the distribution it says affecting mainly the flexures and back of the trunk. Now this is classical of. Eczema, and the skin is uniformly dry. Again, eczema. Okay, if it is scabies, I would have said the, there are rashes in the finger webs and involving palms and soles. Because in infants less than one year old, scabies can affect palms and soles. So this child with eczema. So the answers are regular use of a moisturizing cream, use of a mild topical steroid. For a short period, you can use a topical steroid, especially to the flexural surfaces, and uh, those are the two. You can't use soap with an alkaline pH or acidic pH because both can damage this dry skin, especially the affected areas. You need to use a neutral pH soap. Uh, this is not fungal, so meconazole is not going to help. And this is not scabies. Therefore, permethrin is also not going to help. So the correct answers are A and B. Okay, A and B. Right. A five-year-old child is being treated for daily hemorrhagic fever. Pulse seventy-eight. Pulse pressure forty-five. Currently on three mL per kg per hour of IV fluids. Urine output point four mL per kg per hour for last four hours. In what PCV thirty seven right lung base dull to percussion? What are the appropriate steps in management? Okay, there's another question. Can we give permethrin for an eight month old baby if the baby has scabies? Yes, permethrin can be given for infants. Five percent sulfur can't be given for infants. It is contraindicated. But if you do not have permethrin and if you have an infant. 
then you can use 3% sulfur. Okay, you can use 3% sulfur. Permethrin can be given definitely for an infant. What is the answer for this question? What are the appropriate steps in management? So, five-year-old with dengue, pulse good, 78. Pulse pressure very good, 45. He is on 3 ml per kg. Urine output 0.4 ml, low for past 4 hours. And inward PCV is again very good, 37. But there are right lung base dull to percussion. So there is a uh, effusion in the right lung. So what are the appropriate steps in management? Any answers? Uh, because the PCV is good, no point checking a PCV in one hour's time. Okay, so this is incorrect. He is on high fluid rate, but low urine output, already having effusion, and he is having normal pulse and pulse pressure. So we have some answers B, C, and E. Yes, you need to reduce the fluid rate because he, all his other parameters are very good. So you need to reduce the fluid rate. Dextran bolus, no, you don't need to give a bolus. You have to give a dextran bolus if the pulse pressure is dropping. If the pulse pressure is dropping to near 20. Now this, see, this child is not in leaking, right? He has a good pulse, good pulse pressure, good PCV. He is not leaking. He has finished leaking and the fluid is now coming back but the kidney has not realized it, okay? He has a good pulse, good pulse pressure. His whatever the fluid which has leaked is coming back, but the kidney has not realized. That's why the lung base is still dull to percuss because the effusion can't come back because there's too much fluid in the blood and the urine is not, uh, kidney is not pushing it away. So all you need to do is you, immediately reduce the fluid rate. Otherwise, the right lung base dullness can worsen and you have to give IV fusimide. Okay. So, answer should be B and D. Okay. In shock, we check A, B, G and calcium. The child is not in shock. So, you don't need to do anything. Only thing you need to do is reduce the fluid rate and give a fusimide. Then, the urine output will increase because the good pulse pressure and pulse is there. The blood vessels will not collapse, but it will come back to normal. And then the right lung base fluid can come and replace the fluid, which we have sent through the kidney using the fusimide. Okay. Right. Answer is B and D. In a premature baby, 8% weight loss during first week indicates poor feeding. Iron supplementation is not needed if the baby is thriving. Hypothermia causes inadequate weight gain. Potassium plays an important role in linear growth. Surfactant is given prophylactically if born less than 28 weeks. What are the answers? Okay, we've got some answers. CE. Okay. 8% weight loss during first week indicates poor feeding. Wrong. Right. BCD. Okay, we'll see. 8% weight loss is wrong because up to 10% during the first week is acceptable. So, A, wrong. Iron supplementation is not needed if the baby is thriving. Wrong. Even if the baby is thriving, premature babies need iron to thrive. Right? It is not mainly to thrive, but also to fight infection and for uh, immune system growth. So whether he is thriving well or not, if a baby is premature, you need to give iron. So this is wrong. A and B wrong. Hypothermia causes inadequate weight gain. Correct. C is correct. Potassium plays an important role in linear growth? No. 
it is the sodium so hyponatremia can cause poor growth but not hypokalemia hypokalemia causes muscle power or low tone but it is it might okay you might argue that hypokalemia causes low tone and low tone causes poor feeding but that is an indirect statement here we are looking for direct statements so potassium plays an important role in linear growth wrong Surfactant is given prophylactically if born less than 28 weeks. Again, wrong. If a child is born below 28 weeks, but if the child has been given IM dexamethasone, so not the child, mother has been given IM dexamethasone, and if the baby is having good lung expansion after birth, you don't give surfactant because surfactant has a lot of side effects. It's a good drug, but it has side effects like a pulmonary hemorrhage especially in extreme premature babies. So it is never given prophylactically. Early days it was given, but not now. It is given only if child is showing significant uh, surfactant deficient lung disease, right? So it is given as a therapeutic drug, not as a prophylactic drug anymore. So the correct answer is C. Okay, all others are wrong. 8% weight loss acceptable. Iron is given whether the baby is thriving or not, you give iron. Sodium plays an important role. Surfactant is given therapeutically if born less than 28 weeks and showing signs of uh, surfactant deficiency. Okay, next one. Number 10, regarding childhood vaccination. What are the answers? Oh. I'm getting a call. Give me one minute. Okay, so we got answers. BDE, BDE. Okay, please see. MMR is contraindicated if child developed confirmed measles infection. No, not contraindicated. So you are correct. It is wrong. Even if a child get measles vaccine, measles infection, confirmed measles infection below one year of age, the child's immune system is not able to uh, provide uh, antibodies which can be uh, lasting for life, right? Because the immune system is very poor. So the uh, post-infection antibody profile is weak. Therefore, it is better to give MMR even if a child developed measles. So it is not contraindicated. BCG is not given for premature babies below 1500 grams. No, not anymore. It is given, right? You can give BCG. If if there's a practical difficulty giving a BCG because of the reduced skin uh, amount, like say a child who is about one kilo and you don't have enough uh, skin, you can't, the skin is not visible, then you might not give BCG because it is practical difficult to give a intradermal vaccine. But if the child is say below 1.5, maybe 1.4 kilogram, but has a good amount of skin, you can give a BCG vaccine. So it is not correct. A wrong, B wrong. Vaccine for human papilloma virus is given after 16 years. Wrong. It should be given after 12 years. Right. Polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine is ineffective in a two month old baby. Correct. Polysaccharide vaccines, any polysaccharide vaccine is ineffective below two years of age. Therefore, we need to give 
conjugated vaccines. So polysaccharides are not effective. Therefore, we give protein conjugated vaccines. Okay, protein conjugated vaccines. Uh, oral polio vaccine is avoided during a gastroenteritis. Very good. Correct. E is correct because oral polio will be ineffective if there is a gastroenteritis going on. Okay, so any oral vaccines, when you have a gastroenteritis, you don't give. Right, that comes to the end of MCQs. Now we'll go to the single best answers. A two-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department with an acute history of cough and strido following a two-day history of coriaceous symptoms. On examination, he is afebrile but has marked intercostal recession with strido and a barking cough. What is the most likely causative organism? So these are single best. Only one answer is correct. Okay, we have one answer already. A, good guess. Any other answers? Okay, some are saying A, but there's another person saying E. Right, both looks correct, A and E. When you say barking cough, yes, bordetella pertussis can cause a barking type of cough. But this History is only a two-day history, right? Very short history. Normally, pertussis is a very prolonged illness going on for weeks, sometimes two to three weeks. Here, it's a very short history, two-day history, followed by a barking type of cough, significant respiratory distress, and strido. Now, this is important. When you hear strido, distress, barking cough, in a short history, you have to suspect laryngeal tracheobronchitis or in other words croup and the most common organism which is causing croup is para influenza virus okay so if the same history comes as a two week history of coriaceous symptoms barking cough and strido but not uh, acute strido uh, which is coming on and off strido then you can take bordetella lapertesis but with this acute history Croup or laryngotracheobronchitis caused by para is the most likely answer. We will go to the next one. A 12 year old with, inf sorry, with frequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome has been referred by his GP with a one month history of intermittent right sided painful limp. No history of trauma previously fit. On examination, he has Cushingoid features, apyrexial. And there's a painful restricted internal rotation of his right hip joint. He has normal inflammatory markers. What is the likely diagnosis? Okay, we have multiple answers. Someone says D then E and A and B. E. Okay, all are good cases, right? Now, uh, if this nephrotic syndrome is not given, then transient synovitis is the answer, right? If the part, nephrotic syndrome part is not given. Now, remember now, if we want to get the transient synovitis as an answer, we don't need to give this nephrotic syndrome part. But this nephrotic syndrome, the frequent relapse and the Cushingoid features all tell us that he has been on high doses of steroids for a long time. And then when you take high dose steroids, then and hip pain, painful limp, and internal rotation restriction. They all go towards one diagnosis, avascular necrosis of femoral head, right? 
Avascular necrosis of femoral head causes restricted internal rotation, painful limb, and the most common cause in a child is high dose of steroids. Okay. Slipped capital femoral epiphysis again is another answer which may you might take as correct, but then in that situation I would have given that the child is not only having cushingoid features but having a very high BMI. Right? But when you take everything together, the most likely is avascular necrosis of femoral head. Yeah, D is the answer, right? If I said a previously healthy normal child with no chronic illness coming with uh, painful right limb, normal inflammatory markers, a pyrexia, yes, then the answer is transient synovitis. But because of this nephrotic syndrome, pushing white features, you have to select D. Okay. A mother brings her two-year-old son into the emergency department following a burn to right hand. Analgesia and suitable dressings are applied. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this toddler? Yeah. What is the answer? This is a two-year-old and he has had burned to a significant part of his body, the right hand. Okay. So right hand, hand is a very important organ in our body and it's a very young one. So burns to hands can lead to uh, permanent disabilities or contractures, loss of digits. So the answer is uh, B, yes, E, observe, no, no, you can't observe. Uh, you have to refer to a burn unit for further management. Any important areas in the body, in a very young child, you can't take a risk. You need to refer to a burn unit, right? It's a small area, therefore no need to admit for IV rehydration and IV antibiotics. Even if you want rehydration and antibiotics, you still need to refer to a burn unit. That is the most important thing. Uh, so C is correct, but but it has to be done through referral to a burn unit. So the first thing you need to do is quickly call the burn unit and get their uh, immediate attention because it is the right hand of a two years. You might think there is child abuse but it is not the most appropriate next step so informing the police and jmo is not the next step which you can do later so the next step is refer to a burn unit for further management okay especially because it's an important area of the body although the burn area is small the inward area is very important same way burn to genitalia burn to face burn to ears all need referral to a burn unit. Okay, the next one. A non-epileptic brought to the local emergency department in status. Paramedics have given rectal diaspam 10 minutes ago, but the patient continues to have seizures. Blood sugar 5.5. IV not available, IV access not available. What is the most appropriate next drug treatment to be given? Again, important, most appropriate next drug. Okay. Someone has said B and the other one has said A. Yes, there, there's a debate between B and A. Okay. This is how you come to this answer, right? So no IV access. Okay. So rectal, buccal, intraosseous, all are possible, right? Rectal. But Intraosseous is a very painful procedure, so it will not be the next best drug, right? But it's the most appropriate. It will be the last option. 
so intraosseous is not the most appropriate but the last option okay uh, so now we are left with rectal diazepam buccal midazolam and rectal paraldehyde rectal paraldehyde again has significant side effects if you do not dilute the paraldehyde properly you can have rectal necrosis therefore it is again a second or third option so now we are dealing with either rectal diazepam or buccal midazolam now rectal mucosa is well known to have unusual blood supply sometimes the blood supply may be less than what we think or sometimes it may be more than what we think so by giving rectal diazepam you might get the desired effect or you might not get the desired effect or you might get a overdosing especially if there is a rich blood supply to the rectum now already they have given one rectal diazepam which the patient did not respond so by giving a second rectal diazepam you might get the same result so ideally here you might better choose buccal midazolam because already rectal diazepam has not worked you can theoretically try another dose of rectal diazepam but because it has already not worked it is better you choose a different route so that I, and because buccal midazolam is much easier to administer than the rectal diazepam okay so the best answer is buccal midazolam now there was another question from the previous one in transient synovitis won't the patient keep the limb externally rotated yes very good uh, in transient synovitis it is externally rotated and uh, uh, in uh, yeah yeah but still even in uh, avascular necrosis the internal rotation is limited restricted so when the internal rotation is restricted the patient prefers to keep it externally rotated so in both conditions it will be externally rotated okay the restriction is internal rotation so therefore they will keep it in an externally rotated posture even in transverse synovitis uh, uh, you can tra transient synovitis yes the child might keep the leg externally rotated but here because there was a history of nephrotic syndrome and increased use of prednisolone out of those two you have to take a vascular necrosis of the femoral head and here because rectal diazepam has not worked before better to use buccal midazolam rather than going again to rectal diazepam okay number five mother brings a 15 month old girl with concerns regarding development she is able to stand supported but cannot walk alone she can point to parts of her body say five words mother reports that she takes off her shoes and uses a spoon during the consultation the girl is observed to build a tower of three cubes what is the most appropriate next step in the care of this girl Okay, what is the answer okay we have two answers we'll see ah at last everyone is agreeing on one answer yes you are correct this is a normal child there's nothing wrong with this child uh, cannot walk alone at 15 months is normal so you don't even need to arrange physiotherapy you just reassure and review in three months because by three months the child will be 18 months old by 18 months if she is still not able to work then yes you might arrange physiotherapy and do investigations but otherwise there is nothing for us to do this is a normal child so good number six a 14 year old is referred by her GP to the pediatric endocrinology clinic for assessment of delayed puberty. Uh, her height plots within the mid parental height range. Her bone age is 12 years. Her FSH and LH levels are at pre pubertal range. What is the most likely diagnosis?
A A N E. E. Okay. There are a lot of E's coming. And then now A is coming. Okay. A A. Good. Uh, this is a 14 year old, but her born age is 12 years. So the born age, there's a two year gap. If it is more than two years, you have to look for a pathology. But up to two years, it can be normal. Okay. And her height plots within the mid parental height range. Okay. And her FSH levels and LH levels are pre pubertal because FSH and LH levels go along with the born age. So it is matching a 12 year old born. Right. So this 14 year old girl, well within the mid parental height, born age is delayed, but not more than two years, only up to two years. So therefore, disease conditions like hypothyroidism, Turner syndrome, Down syndrome, hypopituitarism, all are out. Because in hypopituitarism, she will be below the mid-parental height. In hypothyroidism, again, below the mid-parental height range. Turner and Down syndrome, they are short stature syndromes. So they will be below the mid-parental height range. This is a child with constitutional growth delay. In constitutional growth delay, their final height will plot within the mid-parental height range. They will have a delayed born age, but only by two years. So this is nicely matching. She is otherwise well. Therefore, the diagnosis is A, constitutional growth delay. Okay, number seven. A 36-hour-old baby is due to have his newborn checked prior to discharge. Pediatrician notes that this antenatal records are unavailable and the mother's vaccination history is unavailable. The baby is symmetrically growth restricted, red reflexes are bilaterally absent and a heart murmur is noted. What is an echocardiogram most likely to show? Okay, we are getting some answers. D, A, B. Okay, good. We got the answer finally. Uh, mother's vaccination history not available. Antenatal records not available. Then this is likely that the mother has not followed up clinics properly and got vaccination. So we are very worried about rubella here. And congenital rubella they can have growth restriction, cataracts, therefore red reflexes are absent bilaterally and they can have heart problems. So this is a nice triad for congenital rubella syndrome. Growth restriction, cataracts and heart murmur and the most common heart condition seen in congenital rubella is pulmonary stenosis and patent ductus arteriosus. Okay. So all starting with P, pulmonary stenosis and patent ductus arteriosus are the two common conditions seen in congenital rubella. So the answer is B, patent ductus arteriosus. Okay. And oh, wait. Yeah, sorry, I have missed one question. So we'll go to the ninth question. A 12-year-old girl is concerned about her episodic abdominal pain and loose tools over the last year. Crampy abdominal pain followed by the need to pass tool, which happens about twice a month. Her bowel habit is normal on other days. There has never been any blood and she has not lost any weight. Diagnosis. Okay, we are getting answers. C, C, B, fabricated illness. Okay. C, yes, yes, you are correct. Crohn's disease, unlikely because there is no loss of weight and only twice a month, uh, other days normal, no blood, very unlikely to have Crohn's disease. Abdominal migraine, recurrent abdominal pain syndrome. Normally there is pain, abdominal pain, but no bowel habit problems, right? 
in recurrent abdominal pain syndrome bowel habits are normal in abdominal migraine you get severe abdominal crampy abdominal pain but the bowel habits will be normal but here you get a classic symptom of abdominal pain followed by the need to pass stools which ha happens about twice a month right uh, and this crampy abdominal pain relieved by the need to pass stools is very commonly seen in irritable bowel syndrome so the correct answer is irritable bowel syndrome yes you are correct c okay we'll go to the next question again oh, sorry that's eight this is number nine a two-year-old girl is brought by parents with concern of recent onset breast development examination did not reveal any other secondary sexual characteristic her growth parameters were at upper normal limits the born age was four years and six months what is the most appropriate management of this child Okay, we are getting some answers e a and b e a and b okay we'll go through the answers two year old girl breast development very common normally we see we call it premature tail okay but here there are some concerns uh, bone age is significantly advanced, four years and six months. She's only two years. So bone age being advanced more than two years, you have to suspect a pathology. Now, there are no other sexual secondary characteristics like uh, hair growth or menarche, but her growth parameters are at the upper normal limit. So there is a height spurt and breast development. So this is premature puberty. Uh, sorry, precocious puberty, the true precocious puberty, okay, which is common in girls. So this is a true precocious puberty because there is breast development and a height spurt. That's why the growth parameters have come to the upper normal limits. And when you have premature precocious puberty or, or true precocious puberty, your bone age will be advanced. And in children, if you see a uh, true precocious puberty you have to always suspect a central cause therefore MRI scan of brain is a must so most appropriate is MRI scan of the brain FSHLH yes you need to do that will be elevated but that is not the most appropriate Caritap is not needed reassure and arrange continuous no reassure that the breast will gradually disappear no it will not disappear it will keep on growing because this is true precocious puberty okay we go to the last question yeah a a baby born to a mother with gestational diabetes mellitus weighed 4.3 kilos at birth over the next three months the baby's weight line dropped to a point line between mean and plus one st he was sleeping two three hours after feed and passed urine eight to ten times per day with regular bowel motions the most appropriate management step is to admit to investigations, give express breast milk as top ups, reassess breastfeeding technique and correct it, reassure and continue growth monitoring, start formula top ups to give extra energy. Okay, we are getting some answers. D, 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 all right, okay, you know about catch down growth, very good. So this is a child who is having overgrowth simply because of gestational diabetes mellitus, uncontrolled gestational diabetes mellitus resulting in overgrowth at birth. And over the next three months, the baby has gone to a weight point, which is lying between mean and one ST, which is very much acceptable. So uh, overgrowth baby has now gone down to reach the median level which is called appropriate catch down growth okay and she is feeding there's nothing wrong with breastfeeding or energy demand so you know need to do not do anything except reassure and continue growth monitoring so good okay so with this we come to the end of the mcqs and sbas 
if you have any quick questions you can either ask me directly now or put to the chat box oh you know my email so you can send me you have discussed uh, during these last two hours and i am more than happy to answer those okay i think ah yes there is a question uh, ah okay thank you. <laughs> not a question right yes thank you right so we'll stop there thank you sir right okay thank you sir thank you sir. Thank you, sir. good night thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir.